Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, June 19th, and this is the weekly market update. Of course, the disclaimer, anything that you hear or see or is discussed on this video or podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So this week's reality check, um, you know, we've had a pretty good run in a lot of our resource-based stocks, value stocks. And a lot of this was based on basically a reflation trade. And the reflation trade was happening because the Federal Reserve, not just in the U.S., but around the world, the central banks were pumping money into their respective economies along with the fiscal uh, stimulus and support programs from the various governments. And so we were seeing, I mean, you can go to start stock charts and look up pretty much any commodity, any type of commodity stock. And they were all got nuked last February, March. And then the recovery started and they've kind of been up in a 45 degree angle going upwards. And during that over year period, if you will, since that, um, we haven't really seen any major pullbacks. And like I said, most of this reflation trade has been facilitated by Federal Reserve uh, actions. And so last week was kind of, we had the Fed meeting and it kind of had a little bit of a reversal, not a little bit, a lot. There was a big dislocation that took place in a lot of the stocks and markets that we're involved in. And so we want to discuss it. Because as I've said before in previous videos, the debate between inflation and deflation continues. Getting it right will mean the difference between making money and losing money. It's very important that this is gotten correct. So we have to understand what's happening and we have to see if, uh, how that's going to affect our companies, our stocks, and our thesis. So... You know, the first bullet point here, the Fed took some of the wind out of our sales last, sales this week. Why? Well, Chairman Powell indicated that discussions on tapering are taking place at the Fed. Not only that, um, the original message was we would not see rates rise until after 2023. Now, this has possibly, possibly moved forward into 2023, and some analysts and some indicators are showing that we might see the first rate hike in late 2022. So possibly, might, could, maybe, a lot of these type of words were used. Now, let's take into consideration something else. You know, two of the things that I think that drive markets for the most part are sediment and psychology, basically, and liquidity. So the liquidity has been there, and the sediment has got continuously bullish over the last year. I mean, who isn't talking about the inflation trade? Who isn't talking about inflation? Who isn't talking about you have to get out of, you know, values coming back? I mean, that's the discussion du jour. Everybody is on that. And so you had a lot of people, even people that don't have a belief in a reflation trade, they were on it because it was moving. And so what happens a lot of times is you have these discussions at the Fed and there's a hint now that the policy that allowed for this massive run that we've had may be, could be, possibly could reverse in the next, you know, over a year from now. And so what happens is a lot of people that are just, you know, traders, they start dumping, the algos come in, uh, machine trading starts dumping this stuff, and you get a pullback. I mean, a lot of technical damage was done in a lot of the, I mean, copper, I think, you know, a couple of weeks ago was 450 a pound. It's 415 a pound now. That's still pretty decent, but it's broken through the 50 day moving average and it's heading towards the 200 day moving average, which is around 375. Would I be surprised to see it kiss 375? No, I wouldn't. Could it go through at 375? Absolutely. And keep going down. I don't know the future. So I think a lot of these things were overbought. I think a lot of money had flowed into these speculative money. And now we're going to see the air start coming out of some of this stuff with the excuse being, 
that the Fed is you know, going to raise rates, the economy is going to slow down, yada, 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 the dollar is going up, commodities and resources are inversely correlated to the dollar and this type of stuff. So um, you have to you know, kind of understand those inner market developments. You have to understand it's not a one-way street. We talked about this in previous videos. I talked about the fact that we were on a good run, we were on a good heater, good winning streak. I mean, everybody's accounts should be way up there from where they were at the start of the year if you've been following what we've been doing. And so it was inevitable that we'd have a pullback. Nothing goes straight up. Remember when we were talking about gold around this time last year, August of last year, I think it was August of last year, and it hit over 2,000 and we kind of sold some of our gold stocks. And we've seen gold now down for the last you know, nine, 10 months. So this is what can happen in these markets. You know, I do not think that the commodity bull market is over by any stretch of the imagination. I'm going to give you uh, as a pretty good note out from Goldman that kind of explains it pretty good and better than I can about why I think that. Nevertheless, um, like I said, sediment has changed now. Um, it's weakened. We've had some technical damage. And so we're going to have to see what's the real supply dem demand dynamic that will get the price of copper, for example, where it needs to be. I don't know if it's 450. I don't know if it's 415. I don't know if it's 350. So we'll have to see. Um, but volatility is here. And this is why you have to really come up with a thesis and understand. Otherwise, you're just a trader. And I don't trade. Remember what we talked about, I don't trade. So I believe that over the next five years, 10 years, you know, we have had a, uh, we're going to have a commodity bull market. I think a lot of these commodities are going to be much higher by the end of the decade and, uh, or three to five years down the road. But how do you get there from here? You know, my thesis, I think that I've kind of really been thinking about where I think I'm at on this is that I think the inflation reflation trade, if you will, narrative will be the dominant narrative for at least, you know, six months to a year probably closer to the six months. I think we'll see these rates move higher, the sediment will change, and um, we'll see a period of disinflation. We will see a pullback, maybe, I'm not sure if it'll be a recession, but we will see something will break. And then, you know, that'll be in the medium term. And then I think longer term, where we get the final push in this commodity cycle will be a mass massive inflation after that. So you have the initial, it, reflation, inflation that we're in now, that's going to get tempered probably, maybe enter a disinflationary period. Um, we'll see if that happens. That could last a year or so. And then, you know, I think inevitably the playbook is anytime the stock market falters, anytime the economy falters, anything the time the markets are starting to, you know, go down, the Fed will always come back and spend, you know, print more money and, and, and buy and do what they normally do, which is reflate all roads lead to inflation. Um, but I don't think, you know, you know, you look at Goring and Rosenzweig, they think that based on copper, I'm just picking on copper because it's easy to talk about for an example. You know, they see copper possibly getting to $15 a pound during this cycle based on movements during previous cycles. They think gold will get to 10,000. Is that going to happen in this year or next year? No, but you can see it happening. And uh, so how the, the the question is, is how do we get from destination, you know, from A to Z with all the other letters in between and all the ups and downs we have to do? Because bull markets, I believe we're in a secular bull market for resources and commodities. They've been out of favor, the underinvestment, all the things we've talked about, but it won't be a one-way street. And I think a lot of people got spoiled and, you know, now you've got this drawdown and we'll see how people react. You know, we're coming up to the end of the quarter. So probably people that were trading this reflation trade, they're probably liquidating now. They probably don't want this stuff on their books when they have to go report out to limited partners or investment committees. So, you know, we could see some more weakness going into the end of the quarter. We'll just have to see how it goes. But the news I continue to read is there's still a lot of shortages out there. There's still a lot of bottlenecks. Uh, you remember what happened with the Suez Canal ship caught there. Um, but we have something even bigger happening in China right now where one of the major ports in southern China has been closed because of a uh, recent uh, COVID outbreak, the Chinese government. So you've got bottlenecks still in the system all over the place, which are inherently inflationary. You have government policy in Peru and Chile swinging decidedly to the left. These are the 
you know, number one and two, I believe, copper producers in the world. You have a lot of things going on. You still have a lot of fiscal uh, stimulus coming, although it's waning here in the U.S. at least. But that's also offset with some other things. You have the you know, Chinese credit impulse. We talked about that as going negative. So that has been a negative, deleterious effect to commodities. But that you know, comes with a lag and a lead also. So we'll have to see. You have a lot of factors in there. So it's not going to be a one-way street. There's going to be volatility. And um, we're just going to have to see. Uh, we may sell some of these positions down and move on and then come back at a lower price because I don't want to be this guy that rides it in up and down 50% drawdowns. I'm, I'm not interested in doing that. So we'll take a look at some of these things on an individual basis and then, uh, you know, just go from there. Uh, I don't see myself selling any of my uranium holdings. I just think that's something you just buy and hold and buy on more on dips. And I think the thing that was really very interesting during this drawdown this week or the reaction we saw, I mean, I saw corn and soybeans got killed uh, copper got killed. Uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, base metals got killed. Oil didn't seem to really get knocked down at all. And that is tremendous. I mean, I think there's, I think oil price is going to surprise to the upside this year and into 2022. And I think that's going to become a big problem also because of the fact that oil is so ubiquitous and so inculcated into our modern civilization that if it continues to go up in price, which I believe it will, that that's going to carry over into other prices. So we have a lot of things. We have a lot of plates in the air here, and uh, it's getting more and more complicated. But uh, you know, we'll just have to track it on a weekly basis and see uh, adjust accordingly. So I wanted to talk about this. This is another thing that happened. I don't believe there was any collusion here. This just happened to be uh, something similar. You know, the Chinese are massive consumers of a lot of these commodities, and they were crabbing about the fact that um, a lot of the prices were getting out of control. So one of the things they've done is um, they've, they announced uh, in the last week or so that they are releasing copper, aluminum, and zinc from their national reserves to boost market supply and guide commodity prices to a return to normal ranges. Um, secretive by nature, it rarely publicizes full details of the metals, energy, and food products it purchases or sells, but a mere whisper that the agency is about to act is enough to move markets as seen this week when global copper, zinc, and aluminum prices slipped in the news of the planned stock sales. China is the world's top metals consumer, and a major release of reserves could significantly change global supply demand balances. That's very true in the short term. It cannot do it in the long term because it's still in its S curve of, you know, getting wealthy and they, they still, you know, per capita copper consumption to get where they need to go is still going to be in growth mode longer term. In the short term, these little things can happen. These things can be, you know, affect the market, but this was just piling on. This was fuel for the downside when this news came out uh, with the Powell new, the Fed uh, discussion. And then this, you know, people just hit the sell button and walk away. But uh, this this will be trans. This will be transitory. They can only sell so much, and then what are they going to do? Not buy copper, not have any copper, so uh, or zinc or aluminum or whatever. So we'll have to follow this. Uh, but uh, they've done this before. This isn't the first time they've done this. But I, I believe this will be transitory. So this is the um, this is the note from Goldman. Um, you could take it for what you'd like. I mean, are they self-interested? Yes. But I, I like this because it really explains it uh, in a way to understand it and to really think about when you think about this. Uh, and you go down here to the first paragraph. It says, you know, fighting physical inflation requires action. Physical markets don't respond to talk. The bullish commodity thesis is neither about inflation risk nor Fed forward guidance. It is about scarcity and strong physical demand. The only thing that can fight real physical inflation is rate hikes, not talk of rate hikes. As we have emphasized in the past, commodities and the physical markets that make up the CPI are spot assets that are mostly void of expectations and are determined by today's supply and demand, where the talk of potential rate hikes two years from now is entirely immaterial particularly when such talk drives down the far more material 10-year yield. In addition, 
The Fed made it clear that they would continue to purchase bonds at an unprecedented rate and talked about tapering towards the end of this year. This means they would just be buying bonds at a slightly slower rate. The bottom line is we once again see this talk, like the China talk several weeks ago, as a buying opportunity. However, as transient shocks from weather and Chinese mandated repositioning have generated negative technical breakthroughs in the X energy commodity space, we see the recovery from this latest dip taking longer than the other recent bouts of selling pressure. I think that sums it up. I think that's the best way to explain it right there. Uh, when you're talking about these commodities, uh, yes, they can get overbought or oversold um, in the short term. In the medium term, the Chinese can you know, flood the market for the short term from the reserves. But in the end, you have to turn around and buy them back at some point. So like I said, in the Fed statement, if you read it, if you read what they said, there was a lot of could, maybe, it might happen, that kind of stuff. No definitive dates or anything like that. So um, do I think it was some jaw boning? Do I think it was intentional? Who knows? I mean, whether or not you believe they actually know what they're doing or not, or this stuff is uh, controlled, I don't know. Uh, I, I tend to think they don't know what they're doing half the time and they just say stuff. But uh, I think the recent inflation numbers scared them. And this will, uh, maybe this gives them some breathing room. I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. But if the stock market goes down, I mean, we saw this before in the end of 2018 in the taper tantrum. Um, we had a 30% decline in the stock market and the Fed reversed themselves. So anything is possible. I'm looking at the overall long-term fundamentals. And the fact of the matter is, is that we have continued uh, demand for these commodities with tremendous underinvestment that has taken place that is not going to be alleviated by in the last, you know, six months or a year. Yes, we've had, you know, I don't know what the current incentive price of copper is. Is it 450? Is it 350? I don't know. Has how much speculation has been in these markets, how much Chinese buying has pushed it higher? You know, these, these metals, we're trading above, like copper, for example, was trading way above its moving averages. It, it, it probably needs a time to consolidate and digest what, and we'll, we'll see what the equilibrium price is. So, um, like I said, I think this, you know, this is what it, I think this makes perfect sense. Fighting physical inflation requires action. And then this other paragraph says financial markets do now financial markets do respond to talk in contrast, financial markets are anticipatory assets and almost entirely driven by expectations and hence talk. As a result, the Fed's comments, like China's comments several weeks ago, are designed to minimize financial market volatility, not fight inflation. Ironically, fighting inflation requires substantially increasing market volatility through high and large enough rate hikes to slow strong physical demand. Yes, China has now positioned itself to potentially use its strategic reserves of metal, and copper in particular, to calm prices, but this will only feed the insatiable U.S. and EU appetite for commodities that has just now been marginally increased by the Fed through lower yields. Further, if China reaches into its reserves today to meet Western demand, what will it have left over in the years ahead should a major supply disruption develop, or indeed the likely shortages from the fast approaching supply crunch time from 2024? The only previous known copper stock released by the SRB, that's the Chinese in Q4 2005 had no sustained market impact with prices rising 60% over the following 12 months. Reducing stock buffers, whether commercial or government, is ultimately a medium term bullish development. And finally, the overall copper cathode market is heading into a 450,000 ton deficit in the second half of this year, meaning persistent tightening pressures will likely still generate visible stock draws. So there you have it. That's from Goldman. You can take it any way you want, but uh, I think that sums it up pretty, pretty well. And I think that, you know, volatility, it was something that we talked about was going to happen. And we've been a little spoiled because we just had this constant higher highs and higher lows with no major drawdowns, the moving averages all moving in unison. And uh, it's been uh, bliss and fun. And now we're going to get into a little bit of difficulty. And we'll have to see how it, how it plays out. So this is a plot dot plot chart, if you will. And here on this left side, you have the 10 year treasury yield in percent, and you have the core inflation rate along the horizontal. 
And you see that with the current inflation rate at 3.8% core inflation, uh, in the past, this is historical, this is all the little, you know, marks put together for, I don't know how far back, but um, I will put a link to the article to this Nordea um, f- folks that put this out, and they have good commentary about what this means. But the market, you see where uh, interest rates, where the 10-year is trading at 1.55 at the, well, this is a little bit older, it's like a few weeks old. But historically, we should be up around, you know, 5.6% on the 10-year. And so what that's telling you is that the participants do not believe that the inflation is going to be anything but transitory. So this Fed story that they're telling everybody, that's what the market expectation is. But that is so far out of what the norm has been. Okay. Typically, as inflation goes up, rates go up. It's just that simple. So you can see we're way way below where we have been in the past. So this, I guess that's the, what's the market's believing. So if it doesn't turn out this way, uh, you could see a lot more volatility as this corrects. We'll just have to see how it plays out. I thought this was very interesting though, because uh, the next highest level was 5.6% when we've had this level of inflation before. So you're up into, you can see that very clearly when you have 3.8, I mean, you just take it up here. You're, you're up in here, right in here. That's, almost 6% 10-year rates. And if we had a 6% 10-year treasury rate, it would bankrupt all the 25% of the companies on the S&P that are zombie companies. They would go bankrupt and the federal government would, uh, well, they would have a hard time rolling their bonds and selling all this debt that they're selling. So um, we'll have to see what happens. This is, uh, this is why I, I, I still am long-term bullish on gold because I think in the end, they're just going to have to buy their own debt. So, you know, I like talking about the, you know, agate prop. What is it? Agitation propaganda. If you look up the definition, came from the Cold War. It was the description of the Soviet Union's propaganda arm and the political propaganda they would put out. Of course, the U.S. is, you know, that's supposed to be like a negative thing is agate prop, agitation propaganda. But all governments are involved in this, right? They propagandize things. And I think... I'm going to continue putting this stuff out. If people, you know, I, I want people to comment. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about what the media does. I want you to think about that this is deliberate. I want you to think about the consequences of not following their duty to, to dispassionately and impartially just report the news and dig deep and try to find answers. They have become a propaganda arm of the state. And that is the Democratic uh, Republican nexus of of, of evil deep state that I do believe in. Okay. The one thing to, for more money and power. Okay. So let's, let's get to this. So you have this on the left was put out in September 30th, 2020. And what does the headline say? Drug endorsed by Trump, no more effective than placebo at warding off coronavirus study suggests. Remember when the president, I don't know where he got the idea. I don't know that they had the, they highlighted a few of these doctors that were using some of these off-label therapies and they were getting good results treating uh, patients, you know, family doctors, people that know their patients. Uh, however, they discovered these therapies, they were using them, they were getting traction. They had the one doctor that was the uh, Orthodox Jew that was in New York, I believe. He had over 300 patients he had treated with this uh, concoction of hydrochlor. Hydro, hydroxychloroquine and zinc and all this stuff. And he hadn't had one patient die, or I think very few even hospitalized. And, you know, so of course, because Trump said it, uh, and the state and the apparatus, the state apparatus and the media was against him. Well, they were poo pooing it. Remember when, uh, he supposedly said to, uh, people should drink bleach, which is not exactly what he said. They were all over it. Now go to the right Yahoo news. Yahoo, Yahoo. June 9th was just a week ago, 2021. What's the headline? Study shows hydroxychloroquine and zinc treatments increase coronavirus survival rate by almost three times. Okay, so I guess one of two or three things has happened here. Either the studies were wrong here, they were biased, they didn't report them correctly, or they were ignored and subverted because 
Trump wasn't somebody that everybody liked in the media. How many people were denied treatments, okay, because the media poo-pooed the whole hydroxychloroquine thing that Trump was, I mean, you could have went on left-wing media stations and they were, they were pulling their hair out that he dared to suggest these unscientific therapies. How dare he do that? Because science. And now we're finding out now, after he's long gone, and you know, hydroxychloroquine and zinc treatments increase coronavirus survival rates by almost three times. How many people died? How many people died because they weren't able to get this treatment? Why, weren't fam why aren't family doctors and people that know their patients and are in the field treating pe patients, not, not scientists, not people in, in government agencies that happen to be doctors that don't actually see patients, they're making all the decisions. Okay. If we were in such a dire straits and it was so bad and such a pandemic and it was horrible and everybody was going to die, why wouldn't you just pull the stops out? So I want you to look at this. This is Yahoo. And I keep this stuff. I'm going to keep posting this stuff, the hypocrisy, the lies. It's, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, one thing about, you know, uh, well, maybe this UFO thing, whether it's true, who cares? It doesn't really matter. But this is serious. People died. People that could have had therapies, people that may, may have been saved. Maybe they were your relatives. Maybe they were a loved one. Maybe they were your girlfriend or boyfriend or your husband or one of your kids. I don't know everybody's status that listens to this channel. I know I'd be pissed off if I went to the doctor and said, look, look a lot of people are having, having success with this. I'm reading it on the internet. Why not try it anyways? And they were putting people on these ventilators and then they found out that was the worst thing they could have done. They were killing people. You guys know the story. This continues. It continues. The lies, the misinformation, the deception. And because uh, you got to get the vaccine, right? Now you have the new NFL protocols. So you got a guy like Cole Beasley says he's not taking the vaccine. So I didn't have time to put that up here, but go look that up. He can't even do social media. Okay, he cannot do endorsements. What's that got to do with doing an endorsement or putting out a tweet or a Facebook thing with the coronavirus? See, it's the coercion. They're going to. I told you they're going to start tightening the vice. Everybody will get vaccinated. That's their goal. Why do they need to do that? There is no. There is. You know, Dave Portnoy got got thrown off Twitter again. Why? Because he's had a bottle of champagne that said coronavirus on the back, and he said it's over. They threw him off Twitter for a while. They got to keep this. There's something else going on here, guys. And, you know, in the U.S., people aren't getting sick and dying anymore for whatever reason. So they got to keep why, why, you know, in Great Britain, the U.K., they're 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 way down. Their, their vaccinations are way up and they've extended the they extended the opening of their economy for another four weeks. So what is really going on here? That's all. I'm just asking the question. I'm not trying to answer because I don't know. But something is something's wacky here. So this is going to get the Biden administration in tremendous trouble. We've got gas prices now at seven-year highs. Um, why? Well, uh, oil's going up. Oil's the feedstock. You're over seventy dollars a barrel WTI. You're seventy-two, seventy-three dollars a barrel Brent, and we haven't even opened up all the economies yet. So. I'll get into this further, uh, why I think oil prices are heading higher in the near, medium, and long term. And I can tell you something right now, uh, people aren't going to like it if gas is $3.50, $4 a gallon or higher when the congressional elections come up. This is what you voted for, okay? And it's not just all Biden's fault. I mean, it's part of the market situation, uh, underinvestment, but they're put... The Democratic Party and a lot of these uh, masters of the universe are pushing the ESG mint narrative. You know, we just went over what happened to Exxon and Chevron and Royal Dutch Shell a couple weeks ago in one of the videos. And if that's going to continue, there's going to be less investment. I'm going to show that show you that in a slide. You know, I've been talking about this since this channel came came alive about the fact that these are extractive industries. What does that mean? Somebody asked me that one time. You, you need to explain what that means. You're extracting the oil from the earth, from a finite reservoir, from a finite section of rock. It goes through a basically a bell curve where you increase production, 
it peaks and then it goes into decline. So therefore, you need continuous investment to maintain or grow production. As I've said before, Exxon wrote a paper, internal paper, I think a year ago or maybe two years now, where they estimated internally that worldwide, not just shale or this field or that field, worldwide, uh, you're looking at about 6% annual depletion, 6%. So pre-COVID, you were at 100 million barrels of demand with 6% annual depletion. That means you have to find, bring online, 6 million barrels additionally every year just to maintain the 100 million barrels. Now, understand that prior to COVID, you were seeing demand growth of anywhere from 1 to 2 million barrels a year of new demand growth. Why? Emerging markets. So you were having to find each year the equivalent of almost a, a, a between an Iraq and a Saudi Arabia would fall in there of their yearly of their daily production. So Iraq produces around 6 million barrels. Saudi can produce up to eight. So you need to find basically uh, a slightly bigger Iraq or a slightly smaller Saudi every year. And they're not doing it because there's been insufficient investment for many years. And now you are artificially constructing this uh, further by restricting supply with lawsuits and going after these companies and all the other crap that we've been talking about. You're going to have higher gasoline prices. These people are not going to be able, in the time that it takes, we go through this cycle, this current energy cycle, we're going to have an energy crisis and uh, people are going to pay, the politicians that advocate for this are going to pay at the polls. It's just that simple. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take extreme pain to wake people up. I've said that before and People have asked me, what's, what's it going to take to wake people up from this fantasy world? I don't know, five, six dollar gallon gasoline and shortages, they'll wake up then. So we want to talk about shale. This is an article off Bloomberg that I got from a tweet, but this is kind of tells you why you won't have shale come roaring back. Let's take a look at this. After blowing $300 billion dollars, U.S. shale is finally making money. That's true. They are. Let's discover why. Industry scraps pump at any cost model that burned investors. Remember, we talked about that. If you've been a long-term follower, I've pointed this out many times. The incentives were skewed to just drill, baby, drill, regardless of how much it costs. So you issue junk bonds, you get debt, you bring in private equity partners, you get all this money. You incentivize the management team to increase production regardless of the cost, regardless of the price of oil. And that's what they did. They were, show me the incentives and I'll tell you the outcome. We had a tremendous explosion in production in the United States. We had the shale revolution and they didn't make any money. So what happened after the co you know, we had the shale implosion had already started before COVID that put the final nail in the, you know, the stake in the vampire's chest, if you will, the nail in the coffin. Drillers now are set for a record $30 billion of free cash flow in 2021. And they talk about Marathon. Let's, let's look at the article. Marathon used to represent everything that was wrong with U.S. shale. Enormous debt loads, lavish, lavish executive pay, and a seemingly willingness to spend whatever it took to boost output. The company hemorrhaged money and the stock plunged 84% from a peak in 2014 through the end of last year. This year, CEO Lee Tillman took a different tack. He cut his own pay 25%, got rid of the corporate aircraft, and with oil output down 20% after the pandemic, pledged to leave it there. The result? The stock doubled this year. Its peers are doing well too. U.S. wildcatters are the second best performing sector in the S&P index. Yes, we know that because we're riding that wave. After years of booms and busts that produced astronomical losses along with a whole lot of oil, the fracking industry seems to have found a sweet spot. It's poised to generate more than $30 billion of free cash this year, a record, according to Bloomberg. Well, that's just a blip compared with the $300 billion that Deloitte estimates the sector burned over the previous decade, it marks at least a temporary revival for an industry that a year ago had been largely written off by investors. And so the dynamic has changed in the shale. 
uh, people want to return on their investment. Shareholders want to return. The companies have to respond. They drill regardless of the cost. Drill at any cost mentality is gone. So shale will not be able to respond like it did before. At least, you know, if oil gets high enough, believe me, enough money will come in. You know, the cure for high prices is high prices, but we're a long way off from that. So this is an article from Seeking Alpha from a guy, from somebody I follow, if it's a guy or a gal, they wouldn't tell me I emailed them once. I, don't, I have no idea, but this person's pretty smart. HFIR research, talk about energy stocks. They get it right more than they get it wrong. I kind of like the, their uh, thinking, but this is something you need to pay attention to. The incredible thing about the energy stock rally. Well, what's the incredible thing? These are the high points from the article. You can, I'll put a link in the show notes. You can go read it. Energy stocks have only returned back to where they were pre-COVID. That doesn't take into account the fact that U.S. shale lost 1.8 million barrels a day of production, and future oil production has been reduced by up to 8 million barrels a day. The supply deficit thesis hasn't even started yet, so the runway is very long for energy stocks. There are still energy companies out there like Synovus Energy, which came out of this pandemic stronger than ever before, i.e. the Husky acquisition. I don't have time to get into that, but if, you're, if you follow Synovus, you know what they took over Husky. That continues to trade lower than where it was before COVID. And you can look at the same thing. You can take the price of oil currently, $70 and change WTI, and bring up, do this on stock charts. You can bring up the price of oil. You can bring up the price of Synovus, the price of Suncor, the, the price of CNQ, and they're trading well below uh, where they were pre-COVID or where they were when oil was last time it was at $70 a barrel. And these things now are cash flow machines. You know, Suncor is going to pay down debt. They're going to buy, they're buying back shares. It's happening across the patch. And so even Eric Nuttall talked about this the other day. Well, what if general investors don't come back? They'll just, he puts the charts up. I mean, a lot of these companies can buy, theoretically, I say, can, with the cash flow they can generate just at 70 or $80 a barrel, can theoretically pay off all their debt and buy all their shares back in five years or less. So believe me, uh, if the cash flows are what I think they're going to be, and we've had you know, some big moves in some of our stocks in the portfolio, I've, I've been in the Canadian midstream or mid uh, caps, and it's done very well for us. And we've got tremendous more to go. These things, you know, some of these fixed asset companies like Suncor or CNQ and some of these other ones that are smaller, once you get above the cost, everything, the fixed costs that they have, everything goes to the bottom line. Now, the retort would be the other side of the argument as well, ESG. Uh, oil's in long-term decline. I, that very well may be the case, but it, you're going to have another cycle, this reopening. All the rest of the world economy is not open yet, and you're already back to 97 million barrels a day of demand. Remember, depletion is there, and the there was no investment going on during the, the last 18 months at least, or even longer. And we'll show you that in, a, in, a, in this particular slide. So the I put the title of the slide, Heading for an Energy Crisis. I already touched on it earlier uh, when we started talking about oil. What do you have here on the right? These are the billions of dollars in annual global spending on oil extraction. And on the horizontal, you have the years. And you can see that in 2013, 2012, 13, 14, we were spending, you know, $700, $800 billion a day trying to, uh, on oil extraction. And then since then, you know, because of what happened with the shale revolution and the amount of investment or the amount of production, you've seen a tremendous drop off in spending on oil extraction. And then of course, last year, 2020, making a, you know, dropping from over six, seven, eight hundred billion, uh, seven years ago, last year, you're just barely over 300 billion. And so you see the forecast out here. This is going to result in an energy crisis. Unless the proponents of getting rid of fossil fuels are correct, and they, and they start getting rid of them pretty darn quick, like before all these economies open back up, you're going to have an oil crisis. Because of that lack of spending, which has not been able to overcome the 6% decline and the inevitable increase in demand. So prices, I don't know how high they go. 
I, I feel very comfortable. I, I, I've said all year that I thought we would get to $75 a barrel. We're going to get there easily before the end of the summer, probably. $80 is now probably something we're looking at. But I think if things continue to open up and the economies recover, I don't know, we could be over $100 a barrel next year. Sustained high prices will send price signals to producers, but there's been so much atrophy in these industries. I mean, you've had basically depression-like conditions in the oil service industry. Okay, just about every offshore driller, I think with the exception of Transocean, has went through bankruptcy. They're starting to emerge now, leaner and meaner. You've got less companies that do fracking, uh, that do what, all these different services. You know, we've talked about Schlumberger. Uh, it's up over 70, well, after last week it wasn't, but, you know, we've had a good run in that. It's the world's largest oil field services company. It's up like 70% for us. And we're not even really into the real spending yet. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I think it's going to be hard to get inflation to come down and have it be transitory if oil prices are moving higher over the next year or two, which I believe they will be. This is still a tremendous opportunity in my book. It's completely, it's one of the best performing sectors this year. Uh, and nobody is on this because you, the big bunny has mandates. They can't even buy these stocks anymore. I mean, this is tremendous for us. So I wanted to bring this up. Uh, NERC, which is the um, Electric Rel Reliability Council, um, they try to make sure that the bulk electrical system, MISO, PGM, these different areas, ERCOT, all these different things, uh, that they uh, have things in place so that the bulk electrical um, system is not collapsing or going into blackouts. And so what are they saying? NERC warns on power shortages this summer, uh, link to the article in the show notes. The North American Electrical Corp is, NERC, is warning that large swaths of the North American bulk power supply could face, quote, elevated risks of energy for shortfalls this summer, especially if temperatures surge beyond normal peaks. We already saw that in Texas last week. Temperatures have been up here, and they were ERCOT was issuing warnings about possible blackouts again. Why? We're, we're putting ourselves out there as this big energy state, and anytime it gets too cold or too hot, the bulk electrical system is under uh, threat. This is not how first world countries operate. Electric Reliability Organization cautions that above normal heat events pose elevated risk for energy emergencies in Texas, New England, the mid-continent, independent system operator, and parts of the West. Yeah, like California. The California Public Utilities Commission and the California Energy Commission pin the events on a climate change-induced heat wave that drove power demand beyond existing electricity resource planning targets. Now, if you read the article, there's a lot of other things they said also. But what the things they do say is the closing of fossil fuel plants that are base load and their continued desire to close their base load nuclear fleet. You know, these playing these games, this is another thing. This is going to be all fun, fun and games until the power goes out and people die again. People die when this happens. People died this winter. There was horrible stories here in Texas. The state is not prepared for that type of cold. And you have a lot of electric heating. It's mostly electric heating. Stories of a young child that mom put him to sleep at night. Uh, his little brother lived. He died of hypothermia. There was a couple that was an old couple that they found dead. They were uh, holding on to each other, trying to keep warm in a recliner, and they found them dead together. I mean, this is horrible. So this is not how first world, if you think this is first world, if you think we're leading the world, this is another reason to pop your bubble. First world countries don't have power outages. I, like I've said, I've worked in many third world countries. Power go, you're sitting there trying to do something, all of a sudden the power goes out. You have no idea for how long or why. All day, every day. Wanted to put this chart up. Here's another sector breaking out after a long, long basing. Okay, it's the fertilizer sector. You know, with ag prices where they're at, uh, it's the same thing. You know, um, more demand, prices break out. After this long basing, if you will, for basically the last five, six years after this, you know, peak back in 2008 during the last commodity, you know, bull market, if you will, 
here we are breaking out right here. So this is something to watch too. I mean, it's like every sector, look at cold or hot rolled steel is making records it's like $1,700 $1, a ton for a roll, this rolled sheet steel. And the typical price is like 600 or 650 a ton. You look at, you know, coal prices. We, we talked about that. You look at all these prices across the board and they just continue to be rocketing higher. Now, a lot of it's attributable to the shutdown for the bottlenecks, but regardless, the price increases are there. You know, look at the price of corn and soybeans. They're still, even after the drop last week, they're still at high, high levels and that will cash flow up people and send signals to farmers to increase their planting into more marginal land, which requires more fertilizer input. Ergo, higher fertilizer prices. So we'll, something else to watch and uh, we'll keep an eye on it. You know, people have asked me, you know, to talk about other things longer term, worldwide. You know, I've given you Uzbekistan. That thing just continues to rock and roll. The news out of there continues to be good. The Uzbekistan fund continues to perform for me. It's been up like 13 months in a row. Um, I'm very stoked on it. It's going to follow the model that a lot of, uh, you know, what you saw. If you missed out on, you know, when Vietnam turned into a tiger, when Thailand, when Indonesia, when you missed all these, and a lot of these countries went up, you know, five, six, eight hundred, a thousand percent over a decade. Same thing's going to happen in like a country like Uzbekistan, assuming that they continue on with the reforms and economic liberalization, which I see no reason why it wouldn't at this point. They're making all the right moves. The legislation's going in the right direction. Uh, we're getting on the ground reports. I mean, things are humming. So I expect, uh, and we started from such a low base. I'm giving you a layup here. For the next 10 years, for your coffee can portfolio, get bullish on Africa. The demographics are positive. The place is not a basket case like, you know, uh, like it's some kind of, you know, mercenary thing back in the 60s or 70s. Things are getting lined out in many of those countries. Growth is happening. People are squared away. Infrastructure, things are happening, okay? There's growth. So how am I playing this? Well, uh, I, I follow a Canadian financier uh, who is known as the Warren Buffett of Canada, and he made a foray into there, into that place uh, with a fund, and it didn't do well. So what he was able to do was merge it with the premier, one of the premier, if not the premier, private equity firms that's been operating in Africa, run by Africans. It has a demonstrable record of creating value, and they've merged it. So you have this conduit built into the West, back to Canada, to pension funds, and to other uh, financial uh, liquidity, if you will. And you have this plugged in group of professional people on the continent that uh, do private equity deals and have been successful in doing that for over a decade. And so as the maturation, as the growth, as the uh, this continent changes over time, you will see uh, Potentially, well, at least the thought is I'm giving you the elevator pitch here that this fund should do well. Consequently, the stock will do well. Uh, it's a holding in the comp. I just gave you enough information. You can sleuth it out. You should be able to sleuth it out. But uh, we bought it during the COVID crash, if you will, and it's up marginally. But this is something I plan on holding and adding to over the deck. It's going to be part of the coffee can portfolio, a long term holding because the demographics, the low debt, the starting from such a low level. All these things are for the positive in a, in a place that's one of the last places on earth that hasn't participated in economic uh, liberalization and industrialization and urbanization. So that's happening now, not across all the countries. There's many countries in Africa. They're not all the same, but uh, you're seeing more of them uh, move in that direction than you're not seeing it. So uh, this is the uh, this is just a chart that kind of shows the CRB. You know, a lot of these countries are commodity based. They have a lot of commodities that are, have been underutilized. And so you see the um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa equity index uh, basically follows the CRB. And so this is without South Africa, of course. So um, if the CRB, if commodities continue to rally, then we should see. Uh, but this this is interesting because it'll be interesting to see over time if this begins to bifurcate and we see a lot of other things happening uh, besides just 
you know, commodity exporters and price takers. So hopefully that's what we'll see. But I thought thought this was an interesting chart. I mean, you're starting from such a low base that, and I think, you know, inevitably, just like I said, the positive demographics and and the low debt levels and the ability and just starting out at such a low base, it just gives tremendous opportunity. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention. People ask me to bring these things to their attention. What am I doing around the world? This is what I'm doing. I'm very bullish on sub-Saharan Africa over the next two decades. If you missed what happened, <coughs> excuse me, if you missed what happened in Southeast Asia, this is akin to that if you, in the uh, early 90s, that whole decade of the 90s. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. I um, appreciate the uh, support, appreciate the um, views. We continue to grow the channel. I can tell we're in a uh, dead spot with the uh, resources because the newsletter subscriptions have slowed down. You know, when the news gets bad in the markets, the newsletter subscriptions slow down. It's kind of like an indicator I use. So we're going to continue monitoring things. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know the future exactly, but we have to kind of read the entrails of this chicken and try to figure out where things are going. And we'll do our best to do that. All right, guys, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks.